So welcome everyone to Fusion EP Talks. My name is Alexi and I'm delighted to present our speaker, Guillermo Suarez, who will be talking about coupling ion cyclotron heating and current drive waves to fusion plasmas in the case where those are not perfect tori. Guillermo graduated from uh, in physics from Vigo University in 2013. He joined the European Masters in Fusion Science and Engineering Physics that same year. He studied in Germany, France, and graduated with great distinction in 2015. He then joined a PhD program in Munich, Germany, based at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Plasma Physics. He specializes in ICRH, magnetohydrodynamic equilibria of toroidal fusion devices and high performance computing. He completed, completed his program just uh, last year. Uh, graduating from the Ludwig Maximilian University. And among many hobbies, Guillermo enjoys cooking, science communication, and traveling. In fact, he curates a YouTube channel on general, general science and uh, fusion research. Before I mute myself and hand over to Guillermo, I'd like to um, welcome him warmly to our, seminar, our webinar. And uh, without further delay, I'll now well, mute myself and hand over to him. Welcome and enjoy the talk. So thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. So I'll be speaking about the, I gave a summary of the results I got uh, during my PhD, which I did in IPP Garheim from 2015 to 2019. Funny. And I'll, I'll be speaking about ICRF coupling in non-axisymmetric fusion plasmas. So the coupling of ICRF waves when the plasma is not perfectly axisymmetric. And I'll be describing our great experiments, modeling in uh, 3D and predictions for ITER. I'd like to thank the many people that have helped me accomplishing these results um, over the, the last years. So I, I would like to emphasize the whole ASICS are great team, the Eurofusion team, all these co-authors, which are people that really devoted time for the work to be a success. And I really would like to mention that. So I'll start with the introduction. Well, we know why we need to heat ions. So <laughs> you, this is a very general introduction. Uh, fission reactions and the reactivity of those increases drastically with temperature uh, in, in certain temperature range. And this is regardless of which type of reaction. And so therefore we would like to heat ions uh, up to those optimal temperatures. At these temperatures, we know very well that the ions are in a plasma state separated from the electrons. And it just happens to be that when you confine them in either a tokamak or a stellarator, and uh, you use a magnetic field of a few teslas, two, three, four, five teslas, the frequency you need to heat the ions in which this condition is met, that the wave frequency you use equals the generating frequency of the ion, uh, is of the order of some megahertz. And therefore we need to use uh, uh, launchers, so antennas that are able to excite waves at this megahertz frequency range. And you see two of these antennas here on the left. These are the uh, two of the four antennas we have installed in ASEX upgrade. And in yellow, we see the resonance region. So at this frequency range and with these antennas, something very interesting happens. And is that because the plasma density is quite low in front of the antennas, the wave that we excite is first evanescent in this frequency range. And it actually needs to evanescently propagate up to a certain region with higher electron density in the plasma, um, which we call the cutoff layer before the wave can normally propagate and hence being dumped by the ions and, and absorbed. And this process is what we call coupling, is the, the study of what happens with this wave in the evanescent region. I have uh, particularly specialized in what happens when this coupling region is three-dimensional. So we have density gradients in every direction, radially, poloidally, and toroidally. So why do we care about coupling? Well, if the wave is evanescent, less amplitude makes it beyond the cutoff. And for current machi machines, such as ASDEX upgrade, this distance is not so much, can be four to six centimeters of evanescent decay. But for ITER, because the plasma runs hotter and the wall needs to be retracted more, we're already speaking about nine to 13 centimeters, depending on the plasma scenario we are describing. And in demo, well, we don't yet know the demo launcher, but we expect more than 10 centimeters distance. So you can imagine that the amplitude that makes it beyond the cutoff is uh, every time smaller and smaller and smaller. So uh, obviously this is a problem to, to make the wave get into the core where it propagates. And why do we care about coupling in 3D plasmas? Well, we care about it because often 
the geometry in front of the antenna is not actually symmetric, but it's actually 3D. And this can happen in a variety of scenarios. For instance, when we apply magnetic perturbation fields for edge localized mode quantum in Tokamax, when we integrate ICRF system in stellarators, which are intrinsically 3D, or even when we path cast to improve ICRF coupling conditions in which we have an ionization, um, which is non axisymmetric like you see here on the right for an, for an ITER case. So in all, in all these scenarios, the coupling region is non axisymmetric Very well. So I, I think I have convinced you of why this is a topic worth studying. So how do we diagnose coupling? Well, this is a typical ICRF system for any tokamak or stellarator we have usually a signal generator that goes into an amplifier. And this is um, this just travels through a transmission line to the antenna. Remember where the wave is evanescent, usually because of the low plasma density conditions and where it makes it to the core. But because the wave is evanescent in this first region and does not propagate fully, we actually have a fraction of the power that we send from the amplifier being reflected back at the, at the antenna. And so we have a reflection coefficient, which is the ratio between re the reflected power and the forward power to the plasma. Now, because the reflected power would damage the amplifier, if we just have this, this setup, we usually add an additional component, which is called a matching component, that if you would like, it traps the wave in this section. So the reflected power does not make it back to the amplifier, but rather stays in this section close to the antenna as a standing wave. And so the steady state condition is a standing wave which evolves in time um, more and more until the amplitude is high enough that whatever gets coupled to the plasma equals whatever we put from the amplifier. This is the steady state condition. So we have a, a standing wave in this section with a maximum voltage. Well, the way we diagnose coupling or a way to diagnose coupling in simple terms is to define a quantity, which is the ratio between how much power we couple to the plasma and how much power is stored in this uh, standing wave section of the transmission line, which is the loading resistance. So the, the more power uh, that is stored in this section of the transmission line, the smaller the resistance. So you can think the antenna as a resistor that dissipates less power. And the smaller the stored power or the higher the, higher the coupled power, the larger the resistance. And because the resistance is directly proportional to what happens in this evanescent region because of the reflection coefficient, we have the two cases in which when the plasma is far away from the antenna, the resistance is low because the wave cannot make it. And so we need higher amplitudes in the standing wave region. And when the plasma is closer to the antenna, the resistance is high. All right, this actually brings me to the outline of my talk. I will show you experiments in 3D geometry in ASEC subgrid first in comparison to 1D analytical and experimental scaling loss of these experiments. There will be a modeling block both in 1D and 3D. And finally, we will do some iter extrapolations based on the results obtained, and we, we will come to the conclusions. Uh, there seems to be some formatting issues because I downloaded the presentation for, from Drive, but OK, anyway, no problem. Let's start with experimental block. So I did experiments in ASDEX upgrade, and an easy way to get a 3D geometry in a, in a tokamak is to use the magnetic perturbation coils that I show here in green. With these magnetic perturbation coils, one is able to apply a field to kink the plasma helically in a 3D geometry. And if we were to put ourselves in, inside the plasma and look at the antenna, it would look something like this. You see the ICRF antenna. And now you see that the flux surfaces, which are here um, denoted in red and yellow, are no longer smooth or axisymmetric, but rather have a change in the toroidal and poloidal direction. Now, you can think that the plasma density sticks to these flux surfaces in the ideal MHD picture. And so what you see now is an antenna that tries to couple to a non-axisymmetric plasma, non-axisymmetric density. Um, I, ha I had a nice video here, but because I'm not doing it from drive, uh, we cannot see it. But anyway, the point is that if we furthermore rotate this magnetic perturbation field, the um, flux surface geometry gets locked to the external field. And so the density is locked to the external field. And if we rotate this field, we rotate the density that the antenna sees. And so the coupling conditions change over time because we change the 3D geometry over time in front of the antenna. And this is exactly what we did in experiments. Here on the left, I show you a few diagnostics we have in ASDEX upgrade. Uh, we have reflectometry, both X mode and O mode. So you see this magenta line, this yellow line, and this red line are X mode reflectometers. 
And this black line is the ohm of reflectometer. These measure plasma density in front of the antenna. And then we have the lithium wing, which is the green line, which also measures plasma density. And a few other diagnostics that are not really important for our conversation right now. So the point is we can diagnose very well the density in front of the antenna in Aztec subgrade. And when we do such an experiment, we see this on the right. So in the top plot, we see the density measured at three poloidal positions by these three reflectometers that I show you, the magenta, the yellow, and the red. And we see a density front, which here is normalized from zero to one, that is traveling in front of the antenna, much more like we, we saw in this sketch here. So as the magnetic perturbation field rotates, the density is perturbed and it travels in front of the antenna, like we would expect from being locked to the external magnetic perturbation field. But now when we look at the antenna resistance, which is plotted here in the lower plots, both for, um, for two different antennas, we see that, the, that this 3D geometry is not integrated out by the antenna, but actually has a net effect on the antenna coupling characteristics. So you see the antenna resistance goes up and down in the two feeding points of one antenna and then the other two feeding points of the other antenna. So this is already interesting. We see that the 3D effects do, the 3D uh, density does have an effect on coupling. Um, Furthermore, we can see this with all the feeding points in every type of antenna. We have in Aztec subgrade two strap antennas and three strap antennas. And the effect is the same. We see the resistance going up and down as the density front uh, travels in front of the antenna with this helical perturbation. And what is really interesting is that what we can do is now play with external perturbation field that we apply. So this is what I show here as this delta phi is the change, is the phase difference between the field applied in the upper row of coils and in the lower row of coils. And essentially what this is doing is changing the density perturbation in front of the antenna. And we see that as we play with this uh, free parameter that we have, the plasma response to the field changes, the density locked to the flux surfaces changes, and the, ch and the resistance, which is what I'm plotting here in this plot D percentage, also changes with the change in density. So not only we see that the 3D density affects coupling, uh, but also that, that uh, it is coherent with the resistance. So it is coherently affected the, the coupling characteristics of our antennas. So this is the first take home message is that ICRF coupling is affected by 3D plasma geometry. Now, of course, what we, why, uh, what we would like to know is if, uh, if the 3D effects are really notable, if it's any different from an axisymmetric plasma when moved towards the antenna or uh, farther from the antenna. So because the wave is evanescent, one can do an exponential fit of the resistance as a function of the distance between the plasma and the antenna, right? The, uh, remember I told you the farther the plasma is, the smaller the resistance, the closer it is, the larger the resistance. And what I show you here on the right are two data sets, one for an axisymmetric plasma. So the plasma is poloidally homogeneous, toroidally homogeneous with respect to the curvature of the antenna. And we move it in steps farther and farther away from the antenna. And then we get this black data set. Uh, so as expected, the farther the plasma goes away from the antenna, the more the resistance decays. And this goes with an exponential trend. And if we make a simple fit, we get a radial decay parameter of the order of 17.5 or so meters to the minus one. If we do the same with our 3D experiments, however, we find that the radial decay parameter is much, much smaller of the order of 6.5. So this tells us that the impact that this uh, helical density front has on coupling is actually smaller than moving the whole plasma column away from the plasma. And this is interesting because the 3D plasma geometry impacts coupling differently than axisymmetric geometries. So therefore, one would expect uh, to not be able to describe this by typical scaling laws and 1D analytically derived expressions that we, uh, that we usually use on a common day basis to predict antenna coupling characteristics. And so in fact, this is what we see. When I compare the loading resistance change as a function of the distance between the, again, antenna and the cutoff, remember this is the important distance all the time, I get this red data set, which are my experiments. And when I compare against the axisymmetric experiments, which is this magenta line, then obviously we find the same divergence that, that was, saw, what was seen in this picture. And when I compare against different scalings, this uh, analytical scaling, which is this yellow line, this green scaling in which I took the lower limit, which was also for us exaggerate, we are not able to fit the 1D, sorry, the 3D experiments at all. And what is very interesting is that I also included this 
blue dash scaling, which is called the Bilato scaling, which is very often used in the literature, which is meant to fit 1D um, axisymmetric plasma coupling conditions. And for some reason, it fits very nicely our 3D coupling conditions, sorry, but it doesn't fit at all our 1D <laughs> experiments. So I also show you this to, to tell you that sometimes you might find something that works in the literature. And then when you look closely at it, you, you find that it, it, is, it is this scaling, yeah, actually the, the one that is wrong because it fits by casualty our 3D data set, but it's, me, it's not meant to fit a 3D data set. It's meant to, to fit a, a 1D data set that we see here. And it actually does a pretty poor job at, at fitting the 1D data set. But uh, one may jump to the erroneous conclusion that, okay, 3D, 3D effects are not so important because we can get this 1D data set and fit them. But in fact, it's not true because this, uh, this scaling performs very poorly when trying to fit 1D coupling conditions. So the third take home message is that 1D scaling loss do not describe experiments in 3D geometry, which could be this magenta line, this yellow line. And again, I took the lower limit for this green line. And even taking the lower limit, we don't get anywhere close to this red line, which are, the, are, are our 3D experiments. And I did this statistically for all the antennas, for all the diagnostics we have, reflectometers, lithium beam, um, two strap antennas, three strap antennas, orthogonal re uh, distance regression, ordinary least squares to get the different radial decay parameters. And the conclusion is all the time the same. In 3D, our radial decay parameters are much, much smaller than in 1D, no matter how we fit it, no matter what tools we use, no matter what diagnostic we take as a reference. So obviously we would like to be able to model this. So first I take a 1D modeling approach for this. And then I take a 3D modeling approach. For both cases, I use a full wave code, which is called Replicasol. So Replicasol is a very interesting code because it can actually handle the realistic geometry of ICRF antennas. And you see here on the right a few uh, the example I'm going to use, which is the two strap antenna in Aztec subgrade. It uses the cool plasma dielectric tensor. So essentially solves Maxwell equations in a dielectric tensor that is describing the plasma. It does so in the frequency domain with a finite elements formulation and uses absorbing boundaries for the waves in poroidal, poroidal toroidal and radial directions. And here you see the wave equation that is solving. And so for the 1D simulations, what I did is I took my 3D modeling full wave tool and I took 1D density profile as, as measured from the lithium beam in the experiments I performed. So you hear, you see here, um, you see here just 60 charges with magnetic perturbations. And obviously each of them has a different magnetic perturbation coil configuration. So the density perturbation is different, but you see here two density profiles. The red one that corresponds to when the density is closest to the antenna, and you see here uh, a very nice sketch of what's going on, and the blue curve, which is the density when that uh, when it's actually farther away from the from the antenna in this three D helical perturbed fashion, and we're going to compare the coupling change between the red density profile and the blue density profile. So when doing this, what we find is a terrible agreement because, as expected from exper from experiments. Um, taking a 1D density profile representative of the whole density in front of, of the antenna, it does not work. We, uh, it really diverges from the experiments in 3D. And what this is telling us is that, uh, well, two things, that 1D full wave simulations are not able to reproduce the measurement in 3D, in 3D plasmas, and that therefore we need to treat our simulations in full 3D in order to describe the experiments, otherwise we're not able to. Um, and, and just so you see, I also, uh, did these simulations in what the, what the, with different antenna models. And I also showed you the previous scaling loss. And you see that the scaling loss uh, have a, a factor difference of the order of three with respect to the experiments, which is very far away, except this uh, scaling, right? Which, which gets very close by chance, which is, I, I think it's pretty important to, to say it because it's, it's uh, <laughs> one might jump to the, to the erroneous conclusions when looking at this. So, okay, now we do full 3D modeling in order to attempt to reproduce our 3D experiments. But this is very complicated because we need to reconstruct 3D MHD geometry because we are applying magnetic perturbations. We need to reconstruct 3D electron density, and then we need to do our 3D full wave simulations. And so I devised during my PhD this sort of workflow that is doing just that, is reconstructing the 3D magnetic geometry of the plasma, is, and for this, we use the BMEC code, our BMEC code, which is the parallel, uh, parallel version. 
Then we reconstruct the 3D density profile. And for this, I use the EMC3 ID in a code, which is a transport code. And then again, we plug this 3D density into replica sol, which is the code I just described. So for the MHD modeling, BMEC is doing um, nonlinear ideal simulations. So this means that the force balance is just a simple J cross B minus rad B equals zero in equilibrium, preserving uh, divergence free fields. And it solves these equations through a minimization of the ideal MHD energy functional, which is the one that I show here. And what you get from the simulations is essentially something like this on the right, a, uh, the geometry of the flux surfaces, which is perturbed when we apply magnetic perturbations. And I show here the perturbation vector with respect to the axis symmetry. And we can do the modeling for all the discharges that I, that I perform. So you saw I, I have a database of discharges. And this is what I show here on the lower plot is a comparison between the displacements from many diagnostics and the, display <clears throat> and the displacements from modeling. And we see that, um, well, the original modeling I performed falls actually a bit short from the displacements uh, from our diagnostics. But we, then we can just multiply the external magnetic perturbation coil currents by some factor, and then we get a very nice agreement. And this is perfectly fine because we just intend to reconstruct the discharge as best as possible. And provided we can reproduce the flux of phase geometry from experiments, this is more than enough to us. So now we will take one of these cases in orange, which uh, predicts the flux of phase geometry really nicely from experiments. And we use it in EMC3 IDNA to reconstruct the density profile. And so EMC3 IDNA, what is doing is solving the <coughs> transport equations for particle momentum and energy in fluid approximation. So you see them here in conservative form. Conservative form is just the divergence of something equals sources plus sinks. And so what I did is to create an EMC3 ID in a grid for my BMAC simulations, uh, which we see here with a point carry plot on the outermost left. And we checked that the, that the grid has, uh, well, it is properly make, we made with two diagnostics. This is essentially the Monte Carlo probability distribution function and also the deviation within flux tips. So this is very technical, but for those of you familiarized with EMC3 Irina, I'm just showing this to, to, to so you can see that the uh, grid diagnostics come very clean for this case. And what we do in EMC3 Irina is we play with the uh, particle and heat cross field diffusion coefficients. So essentially we tell EMC3 Irina how much should particles and how much should heat diffuse perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. And then what I try is to match the, um, the lithium beam density profiles from one of my experiments. And you see here in as a red and blue solid lines, lithium beam measurements, and sorry, as the scatter are the lithium beam measurements, and as the solid lines, the EMC3 IDNA simulation for the full torus. So the red line is the density kink, which is uh, closer to the antenna. And the blue line is the density kink, which is farther away from the antenna, which is this limiter, limiter gray region that I show here. And we find a very good agreement, as you can see, for the full ICRF coupling region. You see the density here on the y-axis, and you see that the fit is very nicely everywhere from 10 to the 5, 10 to the 17, all the way up to 10 to the 19 or so, which is the where the coupling physics happen. And I also show you a few poloidal cross-sections of the EMC3 IDNA run such that you can see the perturbation in the electron density. You see here very nicely on the most left, the kinking of the flux surfaces in the density, and also the characteristical lobes in the X point of the electron temperature. I think these are very nicely also recreated. So because we fit very nicely our experiment, then we have uh, the kind of perturbation we would like in the electron density. We can simply proceed and use this in our replica salt simulation. So here you see the cutoff of the wave as a function of the toroidal uh, position at the upward midplane. And you see that indeed it follows a non axisymmetric geometry as expected from our simulation. So this is already the density from EMC3 IDNA. I just computed the cutoff as a function of the toroidal angle. And we see that it indeed is magnetically perturbed. And here I show you the density profiles that I used as a function of the radius. Uh, between the maximum density we allow in the simulation and the minimum density we allow in the simulation for the coupling simulations here with this antenna that I'm showing here. And you see that indeed, uh, for the different positions toroidally that I took, we have a displacement of the density profiles as is expected from this 3D geometry that we see. 
And so finally, I have the comparison of the computer loading resistance here. As a gray scatter, we see the experiments. As a blue uh, dash, sorry, as a black dash line, we see the average of the experiments. As a red line, we see our 3D simulations with uh, EMC 318 and Replica Sol. And as a blue line, you see the simulations with the 1D density profiles that I showed you before. before. And I think uh, the results speak for themselves that the red line matches very, very well the experiments, whereas the blue line, which are the 1D coupling simulations, are pretty bad at uh, matching the antenna resistance. So we got where, where we wanted, which is to get a very, very good agreement between experiments and the 3D simulations. And we show that indeed we need the 3D simulations in order to reproduce the loading resistance from the antenna, whereas the 1D simulations perform very poorly. Now I show you the, the, the same diagram as before with our experiments. So this is the antenna resistance as a function of the antenna cutoff distance. Remember we had these 1D simulations with diverge very severely. We have our experiments and here we have our 3D simulations. And uh, I separate now the experiments in two lines. These are, this is this brown line and this blue line. The brown line is the antenna that is farther away from the lithium beam is almost in the opposite way, uh, place of the torus. And the blue line is the ICRF antenna closest to the lithium beam. And remember that we use the lithium beam to benchmark how good our 3D EMC 3D density reconstruction was. So it's not surprising that we, fi that we find that our 3D simulations are very close to the ICRF antenna uh, that is closest to our reconstructed density diagnostic, which is the lithium beam. So this shows how good the agreement really is. Uh, we see that the 3D simulations are basically overlapping this blue line, which is the experiments in 3D geometry. And so I computed this radial decay parameter for our 1D simulations and our 3D simulations, and also the relative error of this radial decay parameter between the 1D simulations and the experiments and between the 3D simulations and experiments. And we already see that our 1D simulations, which was the magenta line, have a relative error of the order of 200%. So if we were to use this to predict something for ITER, we would be a 200% off in our calculations. Whereas if we use the tools that I benchmark, we would be only a 16% off from our calculations. So the fifth take home message is that the full wave simulations with the 3D electron density profiles reproduce very nicely the behavior in 3D plasmas. Anyway, I come to my conclusions right on time because I think I had up to half an hour. <laughs> So I think I, uh, I, I hope I have convinced you that ICRF coupling is affected by the plasma 3D geometry <clears throat> and that this 3D plasma geometry impacts coupling in a different manner than axisymmetric geometries. Uh, in such a way that one these scaling laws do not actually predict the 3D experiments at all. We cannot use them in the case at least when the plasma perturbation size is much smaller than the antenna size. In fact, full wave simulations with 1D electron density profiles, which is what we usually could do uh, to predict the coupling in ITER and demo with codes such as topic or so on, cannot reproduce the measurements in 3D plasmas. So this actually tells us that if we do a gas path experiment in which the uh, ionization front is smaller than the antenna front, we cannot use the 1D code anymore. And finally, I have found and I have shown you that full wave simulations with 3D electron density profiles to actually reproduce the, the measurements in 3D plasmas. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and we are open for questions. Yeah, thank you, Guillermo, for the very nice talk. I see that we still have 20 people, so it was most appropriate for the audience. I <laughs> Great. Um, or we have very, uh, 20 very polite people, this might also be. Could be. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, great. Hi, uh, organizer and hello, Guillermo. So, you know, I have no idea of, of the ICH, but it's a very general question for my understanding. So, it seems that the, like the code replicas also, what it's called is, it does not consider the non-linearity or does it? And how, how much effect does non-linearity has in the ICH? You are correct. Um, so, replica soul fixes the density and then we just compute Maxwell condition, uh, Maxwell equations there. So there's no there's no interplay between how, how the wave affects the plasma and how the plasma then affects the coupling. There's no there's no self consistent loop for the solution. It's as you say, it's a linear approach, 
in, in the sense that we keep the plasma fixed and then we just compute the coupling result from there. Um, for ISRF antennas, we do know that there's convective cells and other nonlinear effects that do play a role in coupling. And in fact, there's some papers by Wei Sang um, that studied these, convec these convective cells with, uh, I don't know if it was Replicasol or another code in which he actually did a iteration loop between Replicasol and EMC3 DNA a few times until he, he gets a, a converged solution. And the point is that um, most of what happens in the nonlinear regime, so to speak, are convective cells very close to the antenna, uh, not so much far away from the antenna. So I think coupling is not so much affected by nonlinearities. In fact, uh, well, I don't have anything to, to prove it here or to show you, but, I, but based on what I've read, coupling is not really much affected by nonlinearities because the cutoff is a few centimeters away from the antenna. Um, and these convective cells, which um, show up in the nonlinear regime, affect mostly what's right in front of the antenna. So it is very important for things like uh, shield rectification and impurity sputtering, but it's not so much for coupling because the physics uh, happen a bit away from the antenna. And so I think with this linear approach, for coupling at least we are safe with the linear approach. So let's take one more question from Franklin Uriel and um... And then move on to the offline discussions. Uh, hi, uh, Guillermo. Uh, congratulations for your excellent presentation and congratulations for, for your PhD. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, this is not my topic, but um, uh, so let me see if, uh, if my questions uh, make uh, sense. But I would like to know a little more about um, the relation your, your work can, can have uh, with the ITER, with the uh, uh, actual uh, project. Um, do, do, you, uh, will you, do you think you could, you will have access? I mean, in, in I don't know in what, in what way this uh, would uh, make sense, but uh, thinking in, in how to, how you can test or implement this uh, in the real scenario. Are you planning, are you expecting to have some kind of access or some kind of uh, um, opportunity to, to test uh, this in ITER? Okay, so I think um, ITER is a bit far away, <laughs> in fact, at least for, for ICRF, because I think we expect the, to install the ICRF antenna in ITER Somewhere, so don't quote me on this because I'm not 100% sure, but somewhere between 2028 and 2029, because it will, will start with no ICRF. It will, it will start with only ECRH in 2025. Um, and I think from today to 2028, uh, we have to see, we, we have to see, we have a lot of time to, to really think what we want to do in ITER. And as I said, my colleague here, Walter Tierns, he's already doing 3D simulations for the ITER antenna in gas path scenarios. Um, so at some point we might want to also do simulations with magnetic perturbations and gas path scenarios just to, to, well, to clarify really if this scaling is really what's going to happen or if it's a different thing. Um, and then if it's really important and, and we, we find interesting results, then uh, it might be that we want to take different strategies for the ether coupling when we apply magnetic perturbations. And then in that sense, yes, it will have some impact and access in the sense that we might want to adjust the way we do gas path, or we might want to adjust another parameters when we do experiments in ether with ICRF and magnetic perturbations, or at least when we do high power discharges with magnetic perturbations, because this is really one of the regions where it might uh, be most important. Uh, but I think how far it is, it's, uh, we have a lot of time to think and to do a lot of simulations before we really, for us, it's pretty short, but for ITER, I think we have a lot of time to think what we want to do in ITER. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. So thank you everyone for your excellent questions and participation. And once again, I'd like to thank our speaker for this um, excellent talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Time.